Hi, it is great to be back. Uh, this is the second module and in this module, we would focus on writers and writing. In the first module, we had talked about writing as a very important part of any creative process because it is a kind of culmination which clarifies the process whatever your creative focus may be. It may be on sports or it may be on science, technology, design, painting. So, that was a sort of overall general view. In the second module, we will begin to look at writers and writings in greater detail. This lecture is titled Writers and Writing and the module is titled to be a writer. Now, we have structured this uh, first lecture in a sort of manner that it lends better understanding to not only writing in terms of uh, you know uh, professional writing, but also how we can institutionalize it. This was a concern that we had voiced in the first lecture also. So, now uh, this section is actually organized in a certain way and I think I would like to explain this to you. We have divided this uh, particular lecture in three parts. The first part is open ended and we deal with number of perceptions that you may have of writers and writing. We look at changing fluid aspects of writing. We look at mythic as well as historical allusions and we look at cinematic representations of writers. The purpose of this is to really get you to think about writing and its cultural significance. We assume diversity of viewpoints, we assume diversity of reading backgrounds and writing aspirations. So, with all that in mind, this particular part one is meant to really provoke certain open ended kind of response to what it means to be a writer. The second part deals with unraveling hidden dimensions. In this part, the creative writing teachers pedagogic and creative intent is unraveled. And in the third part, we bring you and the teacher together in some kind of a dialogue within the classroom. Now, even traditional classroom really demands dialogue and in that sense, we really carry over from the traditional classroom and we are actually interested in placing creative writing classrooms in relationship to what you have already learned or the manner in which you already learn to read literature, to think about literature and to raise questions about various definitions of literature. But in addition to that, we would really like to develop a certain special position or a certain orientation that creative writing, teaching and learning requires. So, this is the way the lecture is structured starting with general floating perceptions to the teacher's own uh, point of view and then the ensuing classroom dialogue ideally which should help each one of you discover your hidden talent. So, now we will start with the open ended queries. So, the first question that I like you to think about is really linked to why you want to write. This is again in some ways close to the spirit of autotelic activity, which in order to discover your autotelic drives or your inner drives, it is very, very important to introspect, to ask as many questions as you can, so that you can really stay in tune with your inner voices. So, why do you want to write? It may not be possible to answer it in simple ways, nor do we have a set uh, you know way of expecting answers, but basically this is again a process of self discovery that may be 
necessary as you write. It may keep changing also, your definition may keep changing. What in your opinion is the writer's vocation? So, again we assume varied exposure to reading and social uh, framework and to cultural issues and in that sense you may have your own opinion of what the writer's vocation is. A writer may or may not agree with your definition, but what is your sense of a writer's vocation? Does any particular writer come to mind when you think about the writer's vocation? So, again this happens you know the we live in a very imagistic culture. So, it may happen that you have certain set of people who immediately inspire you or they come to your mind when you think about the writer's vocation and they may bring a whole set of values and methodologies that you may associate with the writer's vocation. Do you think of the writer as a male, female? or androgynous figure. Now, if I were to really go in the confessional mode, I may quite um, be willing to share this uh, great surprise in my mind, when I often find that the women learners, when one teaches these courses, uh, they often have a gendered view, where they do not really necessarily place themselves uh, at the center or a woman at the center of the writing process, they often seem to place the male as the writer. Mr. Naipaul may like that idea, but I think we need to look at it much more critically. So, then these are the set of questions, then some others have been added. So, you often hear the term poetic license, when you talk about writers or poets. The term poet is uh, we will use as a synonym of a writer and in that sense you often hear the term poetic license. What does the term poetic license evoke in your mind? What do you think about the widely quoted sentiment, the pen is mightier than the sword? How has writing changed in the context of the internet and communication technologies? Do you think cyborgs can create new writings? Now, it is quite possible that some of the words and terms that we are using in this uh, these set of questions may not be familiar or they may not be accessible to you. So, uh, we would like you to work on these words, figure out their meaning and figure out your response. Again, you may like some questions, you may not, may not like some other questions, but the idea is to provoke some kind of discussion on what it means to be a writer. We thought that it may be a good idea to also dip into many images and many associations, many allusions, which means references that circulate in our cultural context. So, I picked up a few that certainly seem very intriguing and powerful and yet I, I really do not have an answer for the power and the ideas and the metaphors that they evoke. But then the most widely known I think allusion here is to Ganapati as a scribe and the split between Ganapati as a scribe and Ved Vyas as the creator of Mahabharat. So, how do you respond to this kind, this mythic legend associated with the writing process. Very, very interesting ideas come to my mind, but uh, I will share it after you are through with this activity and I do not know when that will happen. The legend of course, if you are not familiar with it, it goes that Ved Vyas conceived the epic Mahabharat, but he needed a scribe. Brahma recommended Ganpati because of his superior intellect. Ganapati agreed to be his scribe on the condition that his pen must not stop while taking dictation. Ved Vyas accepted this condition by demanding that Ganapati should write only after grasping the meaning of the dictated words. Very clever you know on both sides this dialogic process and uh, 
yeah. So, the book was written finally on the barks of trees with a feather for a pen. So, see what you feel about this uh, allusion. The second one that comes to my mind and of course, I have slightly modified my own sense of connection because that is the way it evokes a response in my mind and that is related to the Eklavya tale where Eklavya's thumb is you know sought as Guru Dakshina by Dronacharya and this affected his skills in archery and in our in my interpretation also the ability to write. So, again the Eklavya myth and certain kind of aggression in withholding the possibility to write that is the way I read it. You can read it in your own ways. The third is very interesting really and this uh, refers to a historical situation. As I said there are these varied delusions that we have dipped into and the, not really artificially, but the, they are the ones that have been circulating in one's mind. So, this one is related to the Buddhist theories who sang songs of liberation in Pali in the 6th century BC in India and these were published in the earliest known anthology of women's literature called Theri Gatha in 80 BC. And of course, if you are not familiar with this allusion, the song is given and the uh, source also is given towards the end. This is from a very important milestone in women's writing, uh, you know, edited by Susie Tharu and Ladita. So, we have mentioned it towards the end. So, this is how the song goes. So free am I, it is called Mutta, so free am I, so gloriously free. So free am I, so gloriously free, free from three petty things, from mortar, from pestle and from my twisted lord, freed from rebirth and death I am and all that has held me down is hurled away. So, this is another illusion for you to think about. Well, it is really quite nice to be able to dip into the cinematic representation because we are such a cinema oriented people, we love cinema and we also love the performing arts uh, and therefore, I think right now we would look at two very contrasting images of the writer. One which refers to which is projected in Gurudat Spyasa which was released in 1957 and the other one will be Bhagavan which was released in 2003. In Gurudat Spyasa, the writer is shown as an idealistic honest person. Vijay the protagonist is a struggling poet who is wronged by the people and also the economic system that has dehumanized most relationships. So, this overlap between the economic system that requires certain kind of dehumanization and also the relationships that really only uh, work around economic survival. So, this is how he has sort of projected the protagonist who is a struggling poet and in that frame of reference instead of going over the film, I am sure you can dip into it, you can also go into YouTube and immediately dip into this song. It is one of the most memorable uh, scenes from uh, Indian cinema. So, in this enactment uh, which is titled Ye Dunia Agar Mil Bhi Jai To Kya Hai, the, the poet who at, at this point is also the singer, uh, he presents his anger against the failures of society. He lashes out uh, and he also shares his agony with the audience by you know using very powerful and searing terms like uh, you know this is the kind of society where if I were to use the words from uh, this very famous uh, lyric from Sahir Lodhyanvi 
انسان کے دشمن روازوں کی دنیا مردہ فرشتوں کی دنیا اینڈ یو نو ہی کائنڈ آف کیپس دس اٹیک آن دا سوشل سسٹم ویری شارپ اینڈ فائنلی دا آڈینس آف کورس کیپس رسپونڈنگ دا آڈینس رسپانس از ویری موبائل اٹ کیپس شوئنگ دا رسپانس ٹو ایچ ورڈ ایچ ٹرم اینڈ ایٹ دا اینڈ آف اٹ آل ہاو ایور ہی از بروٹلی ریموڈ فرام دا سین Now, this was a very, very romantic view of the writer who is a truth seeker. And in that sense, I have described this here as a vocation of the writer is born out of suffering. This seems to be the uh, worldview that is presented in this uh, very famous film, uh, Pyasa, where Pyasa is also a metaphor of A, a human being who's thirsty for love, thirsty for meaning, thirsty for creativity. So, uh, you know, it is uh, a vocation born out of suffering. It's not seen as socially or econo economically valuable by people who surround the writer in his personal dealings. And also the writer is seen as a seeker of unalloyed truth. And he, or in this case, it's he, There is, I can't think of a woman writer who's projected like this, but he remains on the margins of society. The corresponding female figure in the film is Gulabo, who also remains on the margins of society. So this is one very powerful view of the writer as a being who is in search of unalloyed truth and writing is a means of finding that truth and to also if not the truth then to be able to narrate one's understanding of what is going wrong with society at large. So very, very powerful uh, film and very powerful metaphor, very powerful point of view. As opposed to that, I suppose uh, there is another kind of point of view which of course may also be part of the changing national discourse. So quite evidently from, uh, from the period of Gurudath to Ravi Chopra in 2003, this is the ethos of liberalization and there is a very contrasting view of the writer in Bahban. I picked it up because it had left a mark, both these films had left a mark uh, and I am sure uh, many scholars would also agree with me that uh, it's interesting to talk about these images that circulate. Now the protagonist in this film, uh, his writing is born out of pers personal suffering in a somewhat reactive mode. It is a way of avenging one's lost place in the familial social setup. The theme of writing or that is the vocation of writing is glamorized by talking about only the end product that is the book. Although there is talk about the suffering that caused the writing of the book, but the focus finally is very uh, on the book and the triumphant quality of that book and the money that it fetched. So again this is a very different kind of feeling or different kind of image and sense of possibilities that uh, this film also evokes. The protagonist Raj Malhotra begins to write after retirement. So he's unlike the first writer in, in the writer in Piasa, his vocation is not really writing. But he begins to write after retirement to deal with the humiliation meted out by his four sons. The a book is titled Bahban, the gardener, and it's the father, the nurturer. The uh, book is titled Bahban and it extends the same narrative, the life narrative into the narrative in the shape of a book. Uh, so the book restores the writer's paternal pride and self-respect and the book that he finally uh, publishes, it goes on to become a bestseller, earning him hefty sums and the Booker Prize. In the award ceremony in the film, he says, I am not a writer. I have only written what life has taught me. So this is another take on writing and an interesting one and you can see what you feel about it. Of course, uh, you know these are images, ideas, etc. that circulate and I think 
I would finally also like to place the writing teacher, so to say, uh, in the framework of our dialogue, because very often the question is why does one want to teach writing? One can teach traditional literature courses, they are also very satisfying. But why is it that one feels this strong urge to create another kind of space and also you know teach writing? So, I suppose certain bit of unraveling of hidden dimensions will help us in establishing better understanding of both sides. Very often I do not feel that the students really see the teacher as, an, as, as a person who is trying to aspire to create something on, on his or her own. Because uh, in the traditional uh, literature courses, you usually teach canonized writing or even if you teach writing which is on the margins, in some ways you are uh, playing an oppositional social cultural role, but you do not invest your own presence in that to the extent that you would do while teaching writing. So, there are couple of ideas I would like to share with you. Perhaps it may be quite all right to sort of mention that many teachers of writing consider the classroom as the teacher's atelier that is like an artist studio or a workshop. Uh, it is a kind of a space for sharing new ideas about writing and the writing process. So, you of course are focused on the students, but you are also using this opportunity to choose ideas and eclectically and also to share them with uh, young people. And also in some ways your own writerly concerns are shared explicitly or implicitly, it depends on the kind of dialogue that is possible in a group. It is not always possible to foreground one's presence and writing in such a direct way. So, it often depends on the nature of the dialogue which emerges, uh, but at the same time this is a kind of hidden dimension which animates the teaching process. I would share a few things about this uh, in a little while. Here are some of the samples of my writing. Rashmi Chaudhary, herself a Hindi writer and a doctoral student in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, will read Dange Ke Baad. Do Pahar Ke Shavasan, Jeevan Mein Jeevan Ko Bhoolne Ki Kshanik Koshishin, Man Mein Sannato Ka Haakar. मंदिर के पिछवाड़े की परछाइयों में एक नई घंटी बजकर थम जाती है ताजे जले मुर्दों की गंध अगरबत्ती सी फैल जबान को कसैला कर जाती है दोपहर की गर्मी से जले हुए शरीर की चिपकी चमड़ी के भीतर समाई हुई सुन्न होती आत्मा को मंदिर के पीछे की कनेर की झाड़ी सा झिझोड़ न जाने कौन से ईश्वर के इंतजार में इस जलती दोपहर में गंगा जल उड़ेल देती हूँ। The second sample chosen by Professor Talwar is an excerpt from the play A Dream in Three Acts, which, in the introduction to the play, has been described as an attempt to reconcile multiple voices and languages that coexist within the writer. In Act One, in a dream-like encounter, Navanita, the protagonist, is seen in conversation with Simone de Beauvoir. Navanita looks up to Beauvoir as a source of inspiration in her search for her identity, which also needs to confront the diversity and multilinguality of her own cultural experience. The rest of the play deals with this struggle and celebration of search. The scene descriptions within the dialogues have not been included for this reading, though the introductory scene description will be read by Rashmi. The sequence has a dream-like feel. The scene description has been read by Rashmi Chaudhary, the part of Navnita been played by Shikha Lakhanpal, and that of Simeon Deva has been played by Smita Pendhagar. A dream in three acts. 
Act 1. Two women enter. They are deeply engrossed in their conversation. One of them is Navanita, a young modern Indian woman dressed in a deep maroon muslin sari and an attractive woman blouse of the same color. She has a large red tikka on her forehead. The other woman is Simone de Boa, the French existential philosopher who is wearing an austere looking black frock and a black turban. Their dresses indicate not only the external cultural differences, but also the way they relate to themselves. Boa is older and more analytical. Navanita is younger and more focused on sensory experience. My dear, I am indeed pleased to meet you. But I'm a bit surprised by your choice of locale for this interview. Madame Bouveau, it is to have undisturbed time with you that I venture to suggest this location. And as you know very well, the forest holds great fascination for a woman. A sense of presentiment. An openness of sorts. So I hope you don't mind this place. Many young women of my generation have been greatly influenced by your ideas. Could we sit down and talk? Are you talking about the second sex? The development of the male is comparatively simple. Woman's story is much more complex. From puberty to menopause, woman is the theater of the play that unfolds within her and in which she is not personally concerned. Our task is to discover how the nature of woman has been affected throughout the course of history. We are concerned to find out what humanity has made of the human female. Yes, Madame Bouveau, it is this very book and this very question that I'm referring to. What humanity has made of the human female? Yes, my dear. Um, we will have to answer it for each of our cultures. How would you answer this question? Dowry, dowry deaths, amniocentesis, parda, have you heard of these? That's what the Indian woman is confronted with. A life within the four walls of the family. And yet, personally, when I'm home with my family, peace descends on me. I feel loved. The light of each morning fills me with gratitude. Why did you reject family and marriage as an alienating institution? Why did you want a life of isolation? Can I ask you a personal question? Why write the novel She Came to Stay if you did not want any commitment from Sato? Why the agony over losing him to another woman? Madame Bouveau, what is our truth? One is not born but rather becomes a woman. It is civilization as a whole that produces this creature. Are we merely then the products of cultural osmosis? Can I ever view myself as I am or as I want to be? My thoughts flow. My tales are French. My landscape is French. He went out again. And again, I stayed a long while on the balcony. I watched an orange-red crane turning against the blue background of the sky. I watched a black insect that drew a broad, foaming, icy furrow across the heavens. The eternal youth of the world makes me feel breathless. Some things I have loved have vanished. A great many others have been given to me. Yesterday evening, as I was going up the Boulevard Respay and the sky was crimson, it seemed to me like I was walking upon an unknown planet where the grass might be violet, the earth blue. Madame Bouveau, I want to understand my reality through my own experience. Yes, we love, we agonize, we want bliss, happiness. The free woman is just being born. She will love more passionately. She will love more kindly. She will be happier. Thank you, Rashmi, Neha, Shikha, and Smita for your participation. It's indeed a privilege to have you over and really do this somewhat dramatized reading. 
uh, for the video course. Uh, Rashmi is a doctoral student in sociology. Neha, you already know, and she has background in literature, and she is really committed to writing. Uh, Shikha ha is a student of MPhil, and she specializes in environmental concerns and planning. Uh, Smita, on the other hand, is focused on gender studies. So, you can see that uh, these are all diverse uh, kind of backgrounds, but all of them also are very interested, very keenly uh, interested in the writing process and writing and finding their own sense of self. So we will have them on board later on also. Now, coming back to my own writing, while teaching the creativity and creative writing classes, I have actually rarely shared my own writing, but my writerly concerns have enabled me to, to be sensitive to the questions students often ask. On the other hand, in the western framework, especially in countries like the US, UK, Australia, Canada, writing classes are now routinely taught by published writers and in addition to that, they often uh, invite reputed writers uh, in order to be you know writers in residence to add to the value of institutional effort. And I uh, mention this because while teaching the creativity course in IIT Bombay, one had to steer the direction of this course amidst criticism oriented though contemporary humanities and social science courses and of course, the engineering and science courses. It could thrive though in a limited way primarily because it provided targeted one semester coursework to those who wanted to explore this path. In other words, one still is uh, at a level of trying to create new cultural space not only within just one course, but hopefully in many, multiple ways so that creativity oriented and creative writing oriented concerns can be explored more actively within the institution. Uh, my own creative problems personally uh, could not be woven into this effort because of this lack of uh, earlier tradition of such an activity. For instance, uh, my problem also is actually made complicated by the fact that I write in Hindi, which is my mother tongue, and sometimes I write in Hindi on you know without thinking about it, like you uh, saw this poem, you heard the poem Dange Ke Baad, it just came to me. Occasionally, my multilinguality has surfaced strongly. So, a dream in three acts actually later on deals with that multilinguality. And I have not been able to use code mixing because that multilinguality seems so rich and so powerful and infinitely more interesting. So, I really retained it uh, by way of trying to see if one can find an audience for that kind of uh, thought process. And uh, then sometimes without conscious, conscious planning, my writing flows in English. So, it is very, very hard for me to really uh, deal with these issues and also you know offer these problem areas to students who are also in the early stages of their search. But in any case for my own writing, I have let this happen naturally uh, and published poems, short stories and a play. A theme that has preoccupied me amongst many other concerns is related to something that we will explore in the course further. This is related to the vocation of the scientist. I have been very, very interested in what it means to be a scientist in India, to do science in India, the definition of science in India. And I have been trying to explore this from number of angles, both analytical in my research work but also in terms of creative writing, because I feel that there are layers about it that can only be captured in the kind of space that fiction provides. So, what I will uh, also like to do as a concluding part of this uh, you know unraveling process that I ventured to share with you 
is to share my own notations in the kind of diaries that I have maintained regarding my writing. So, of course, I feel that uh, these ideas have been flowing within me, uh, you know, unabated, but now I need to really see how I can focus on them and give them proper shape. So, I really need to do that, but I will read and show you uh, the pages of my own diary. Uh, so, with reference to this theme of science, I have a notation uh, with the title of a, either a short story or a novel called The Researcher, in which I have noted down a statement for from Gombrowicz, the Polish writer, modern writer, who said, the weight of our self depends on the size of the population of the planet. This particular statement by Gombrowicz, which I think I read while uh, you know, and, and looking at Kundera's own writing and essays, it is uh, simmered within me and I have another notation on the same page which says Simhastha Mela, the researcher's dream, the film. And then later on at some other point in time, I have this other notation in my diary uh, as uh, you know where, with another title called the expansion of species and I have this notation which I will read verbatim about an Indian scientist who works on population control, a modern man's fear of population explosion, personal history of excessively large family, research work, a quest and a reaction, the milling crowds, the repressed sobs, the cry of the unborn, kump scenario seen as a child, the quiet lab, silence of the womb, the scientist playing God, a kind of nobility turning to evil and that is the notation. So, I think uh, I have shared my own personal you know, journey with you in a very limited way and I am sure this kind of sharing when it occurs on both sides, it gives greater degree of understanding of each other's choices and also uh, the kind of world view that we construct for ourselves. Now, based on your own desire to write, your own perception of, of what writing as a vocation means, the teacher and you, they, you establish dialogue with each other. The dialogue is not a very, very simple process, but I think uh, it has to be active on both sides. The teacher should be a learner and you, the student should also be a teacher and these two elements should coexist within the same person. We have talked about it in the first module as well. Now, let us look at some specific kind of predilections of the writer while we bring writing into the classroom. Uh, there are certain issues that we need to talk about. Uh, writers have always existed everywhere in the world and nobody is going to stop anybody from writing. But when you begin to talk about institutionalization of writing, that is bring writerly concerns to the classroom, because you are also helping train people to look at the writer's vocation as a potential future vocation for them, then I think some things need to be articulated. Uh, so, three ideas have been singled out to establish dialogue between students and teacher. So, with reference to writer's vocation, isolation and or interaction, we need to talk about the significance of both. We need to look at this metaphor of the garret, 
versus the ivory tower. We can also look at two writers and some uh, certain kind of metaphoric significance that they evoke that is Kafka and or Camus. So, let us see how we can develop this discussion. Now, in terms of isolation and or interaction, isolation can mean many things, but at this point we are emphasizing the space and solitude necessary for writing. And this is based on this very famous book that Virginia Woolf wrote, where she talked about the necessity and the significance of a room of one's own in order to be able to write. There is a kind of uh, independence, there is a kind of autonomy, there is a kind of uh, space either mental or physical that is necessary in order to carry out the act of writing. So, isolation in terms of the solitude and space necessary for writing. On the other hand, interaction is equally important, but I think it is uh, a kind of complicated for many, many writers, because in terms of your own writing related interaction, it is very difficult to judge at what point one can begin to share one's writing with other people. So, therefore, I have described this in these words, interaction is a crucial but difficult step in sharing either the challenges of one's writing process or a specific finished work with others. It does not come that easily. So, there is certain amount of judgment that is involved in reaching out and you know interacting with uh, other people. So, in the classroom scenario, we assume that interaction will help writers a great deal, but I think it one has to keep in mind the sensitivities that are involved and sort of also help you realize that there may be certain kind of writing where you may feel that uh, you are not ready for interaction. So, these kinds of uh, situations are very, very common. So, isolation is necessary, so is interaction and you have to find your own balance in this regard. Uh, with reference to bringing writing to the classroom, there are some very, very interesting ideas that Paul Dawson has raised in his recent study, a very important recent study titled uh, creative writing and the new humanities, where he has looked at these very cliched uh, in his own words, very cliched, but also very uh, useful metaphors of the garret versus the ivory tower. In his uh, opinion, uh, although the two seem to be at cross purposes, but actually he wonders if uh, that need be so. The garret, the metaphor of the garret is actually uh, sort of associated with a writer's retreat. Uh, according to him, he, it can be this metaphor can be extended to the creative writing classes. Now, how does one do that? Uh, the garret is associated with certain amount of isolation and also certain amount of uh, I suppose deprivation, economic deprivation or certain social deprivation that uh, writing uh, demands. Uh, and according to him, the garret has had a certain amount of romantic association with uh, creativity and authenticity of the writing process. Uh, it is also seen as outside of society. So, writing is outside of society. So, it sort of evokes all these associations in his point of view. And as opposed to that, the ivory tower is a metaphor for established academic systems and often it is seen as a negative description, because it seems to evoke the sense that it sort of shelters the practitioners from harsh realities of uh, actual life. 
Now, in his opinion, that uh, these two need not be separate. Although, actually, if you look at the Pyasa uh, content, the content of Gurudat's Pyasa, it again fits into the metaphor of the garret. And actually, the publishing world in that framework is actually linked to the ivory tower because it involves protection and it also does not challenge uh, those who are who have undertaken the work too much. Uh, the garret in particular and its association with Piazza and uh, ivory tower in terms of certain privilege position in terms of Bhagwan can also be evoked. But in his opinion, uh, the ivory tower and the garret are parable are parallel and permeable metaphors for the academic critic and the writer. So, in his opinion, they are metaphors, but they are permeable metaphors for the academic critic in terms of the ivory tower uh, metaphor and the writer in terms of the garret metaphor. And what he has tried to really establish in this book is to sort of see how these two can be negotiated. It is not possible to do away with these concepts, because they do have certain element of truth in them, but at the same time, how does one negotiate these two in order to institutionalize creative writing. So, both in terms of cre uh, institutionalization of creative writing and in terms of thinking about the writer's vocation, I think you can look at these two and develop your own take on it. The next association uh, for classroom dialogue. So, I suppose uh, in a, a classroom situation, we could debate these two, we could talk about these two, we could uh, have our own take on these in order to pursue our own independent line of creative action. The other kind of uh, question that I raised again in a metaphoric sense was in terms of its links with two different kinds of very, very powerful writers of 20th century, Kafka and Albert Camus. In, if you are not familiar with the two writers, then according to uh, most biographical accounts, Kafka you know, did not want to publish his writing. Uh, so, there, there is sort of a lot of material available on this whole issue. The second uh, writer, Albert Camus on the other hand, was deeply invested in wide ranging writing and publishing activities such as journalistic writing, philosophical essays, drama, short stories and novels. So, now when we talk about it, the question that we can debate is whether you want to be Kafka or Camus, that is do you want to write with a clear aim to publish or do you want to treat your writing as a way of making sense of the world, but not necessarily publish it or publish it sporadically, whenever you feel that some things can be shared with the world at large, but some you want to keep to yourself. So, this is a question that you can ask. It gives you different kind of space for yourself. The other related question can also be linked to the genre that you would like to do, devote yourself to. Many, very often people may or want, you know may have a sense of which genre makes them feel excited in terms of their writing, but while writing they may shift their attention to another genre, because that is also a kind of shifting ground. There are lots of blurred boundaries in terms of genre and so again while talking about uh, publishing or not publishing, uh, one can also look at this question of genre while debating the writer's vocation. So, what which genre would you like to devote yourself to? Because writing 
contains a lot of possibilities. So, we are also keeping that open ended uh, different kinds of writing processes and products may be involved. The other question in tune with the multilingual uh, cultural context that we inhabit is related to the language, which language would one like to write in. Uh, there is this famous case of uh, Girish Karnad, which if I understand it correctly, he has mentioned it in one of his editorial, uh, you know, editorial comments that uh, he wanted to actually write in English, but when he sat down to write, uh, he began to write a play in Kannar and that was Yayati. So, it, it may again be a question that can actually uh, you know you can resolve only when you start writing more seriously. So, now this more or less concludes this first section where we want you to reflect on writers and writing and the cultural significance that you or your society or your social framework associates with the writing process. And we would recommend viewing of Pyasa by Gurudat, a great film with some very, very great moments. And uh, the s dialogues are also available. There is a recent publishing trend where the dialogues of some of the very famous Hindi films, uh, the cult films, these have been uh, translated, but they are also available in the original. Uh, so, you can dip into the dialogues of Pyasa in order to understand the total uh, you know uh, the set of ideas that we have only briefly talked about. You can also look at Paul Dawson, who has tried to establish creative writing as a mode of gaining knowledge and this is with reference to new, new humanities and many of, of the theoretical formulations of the last 20 years in teaching of literature and raising foundational questions about the definition of the term literature and hence creative writing as a response to many of these foundational questions. And finally, Tharu and Lalita's women writing in India from which we have taken the Theri Gatha songs. With this, we conclude this session. I hope you will think about your own self much more actively before we embark on the journey to understand what other writers have to say about the writing process. Thank you.